So, we are privileged today to have Frank Robinson with Union Bank, who's one of the sponsors of this uh, course. And Frank is, uh, so Carolyn looked up a couple of titles on you, but I have your card here, so I'm going to give it from the card. Because I had like Senior Vice President, then I have this. Okay. So, I have here that Frank is the Managing Director of Corporate Social Responsibility for the America's Regional Banking Division. And we're going to have Frank come up and talk to you a little bit about this whole idea of funding your business or loans or, or even how to work with the bank. We all have to have our banks. And um, Frank's going to talk to you a little bit about banking. OK? Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Good evening. I, I know I'm probably the person between you and the freeway, and I certainly understand it. So I'm going to be brief. Realize that I, I live in San Diego, so I got a little bit longer to meet than you do. Here's what I always talk to business owners, and let me give you a little bit about what I do. So I'm in corporate social responsibility. I've been with Union Bank for 20 years. And so what I do is something nobody else in the country does. Um, first of all, I, I'm the regional manager for five high school branches. I have branches inside of high school. So if you've ever been to Crenshaw High School, I have a full-fledged branch inside of that high school. Um, and I hire 12 of their students to actually run the branch. And then we offer them after their internship and making money, we offer them a job or career opportunities. We also do scholarships and things like that. I'm very proud to say that I have um, I have five branches up and down the state, and I'm soon to be launching next year one inside of a junior college uh, at Laney College in Oakland. Wow. And our whole hope is to put more of these young people in position, and not only come out of that being a banker, I mean, not a teller, but more or less a banker. I want them to have a higher paying job. And what you know, just some interesting things about that, 48% you know, of the college students in America are, suffer from food insecurity. They don't know where their next meal comes from. Um, and they have a tough time. So we're going to be partnering with the food bank there to open up a food pantry. So kids don't have to, I don't want the kids to think about school and think about studying and then have to also hear about their stomach. So we're going to try and take care of those things too. A lot of things that we do, and I, I also do a lot, all the volunteer programs for the bank, but one of the things that I also do for the bank is I run something called Business Diversity Lending. I'm the only banker in the country that can ask race and gender on a business loan application. I have a Reg B exemption from the federal government, and I've had it for 20 years. And that, with that Reg B exemption, I'm able to look at somebody who's a person of color, African American, Hispanic, Asian, um, and Native American and look at and say if they are this or if they're a woman uh, or veteran that I can do a more relaxed underwriting for them to qualify for a loan. And I go for $10,000 to $2.5 million uh, on this underwriting. And if any of you, and somebody who's talking about platform shoes in the 70s and stuff like that, won't mention who they were, but let me tell you what happened. Um, in the 1970s, there used to be something called the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, that was formed. Mm -hmm. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act was formed because it was sometimes called the woman's law. And the majority of the folks in this, in this room are women, so you're going to understand what I'm about to say. In the 1960s and 50s, a woman could go into a bank and ask for a loan, and the banker could legally deny them because they say, you're a childbearing you. <laughs> and Look, a loan is only done to two ways. Number one, the ability to repay. Okay? So you gotta have income. Ability to repay, and how good is your credit? Right? That should be the only two reasons sure. for getting a loan. Now, if it's a if it's a commercial real estate deal, you want to make sure the value of the property is there, right? But those are the only two reasons for getting a loan. Not in the fact that if I get credit. I actually wrote a white paper. Somebody asked about white paper. I wrote a white paper on that. On that, it's very common. Because I found in my bank we had done paper, we had done loan documents in what in in which one when I opened it up, there was a medical records of the husband, and the husband had to come in and prove that he had a vasectomy. 
Oh my God. And that was part of the write up for him to get, for his wife to get a business loan on her own business. So he couldn't get her pregnant. Wow. So that's sometimes the Equal Credit Opportunity Act is sometimes called the Women's Law. So if you imagine if they discriminated against women, <coughs> imagine what they did discriminate against people of color. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why you have the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which is not based on race, all of those sorts of things. But one of the provisions in that was the Special Purpose Credit Program, which I have. And like I said, we're the only bank in the country that can do that. Now, I'm not advertising for you to go to my bank. I just said, I'm not advertising for you to come to my bank. Because there is something much more important than banking at Union Bank, banking at Wells Fargo, banking at Bank of America, wherever you bank. You need to find the right banker. Okay? I tell this, and it's very true. I know Magic Johnson. I'm just not sure that Magic Johnson knows me. <laughs> okay? This is what I mean by that. How many of you can go into your bank right now and know the name of the branch manager? Okay, forget that. <laughs> How many people could go into their bank and know the name of their branch manager? Staff, I'm not talking. One, two, three, four. How many of you, now let's put it this way. How many of your, how much is the branch manager know you? Really knows you, knows your business, knows what you want to do. That's where you need to start. Have that casual, have that conversation with your banker. So next time, sometime this week or next week, have set up an appointment to meet with your banker. My dad is brilliant. He passed away several years ago, but he was brilliant. Uh, told me I need three business cards. You need a policeman. You need a business card for the policeman. You never know. You need a lawyer, and you need your bank. Get the card. Let me put it this way. When you start making that first big deal, and you bring in the check, and your bank says, I want to put a hold on it, and you know that check's good, you run to your banker and say, I don't need you to put a hold on that check. And he will, or she will. That's how having a good relationship with your banker is important. Okay, so before we start talking about loans, let's start talking about having the relationship with your banker. That's critical, okay? Because here's what else bankers will do for you. They will, if they're good, you are not looking for a business banker. You're looking for a business partner. A business partner in your banking relationship will do a couple of things. Number one, we as a bank sponsor a lot of business associations. We sponsor a lot of organizations. We sponsor a lot of, we sponsor this. So why not, if you have a great banking relationship, be the plus one at these events, to your events. We sponsor the Black Chamber of Commerce. We sponsor GLAC. We sponsor the Anna Gala. All of you are minority-owned businesses. I don't see anybody who doesn't look like a minority in this room. Now, I'm a little colorblind, but I ain't that colorblind. <laughs> you got to forgive me sometimes. I'm just a country boy from Louisiana. So forgive me. But here's the other one that's important for you to understand. I listened to some of your comments and some of the things that you're doing. Make sure that your banker has signed you up for everything. Like this. This lady that wants to have a potato truck, in a year I want you to be a millionaire. You know how you're going to do that? You're going to get your minority designation. You're going to go walk over to Google. And you're going to have, on a particular day, you're going to have a particular day in which Google is going to set you up to whereby your food truck is going to be there and guarantee you money. Rain or shine, and that's what they do. You don't believe me? I'm, one of my best friends actually works at Google up in, up in the Bay Area. And they are food trucks that come in. Because you know all the folks here get free food. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. One of the craziest jobs you ever want to see at Google. Uh, and we talk about the car industry? No, no, no. Imagine, if you will, you're walking around with an ID, and you see this car in the Google campus. You just tap the car. The car opens up. And you get to, and it's called the G car. 
And you just could take that car for three or four hours, do your shopping, you know, go get, go get stuff like that, and just return it back. That's what Google does. You want food? Food truck? Here you go. Guaranteed set income that you always have. Have a couple customers who've done that. They made so much money off it, they opened up their own restaurant. Mm -hmm. So look at corporate. You're thinking of mom and pop. You're thinking of everyday customers coming in. Also think of corporations to do business with. Where are these customers coming to do and saying, they got to talk to you? Remember, your minority designation will allow them to say, I do business with women-owned companies. I do business with black-owned businesses, Hispanic, Asian, right? So they're looking for you. But a banker should be able to help you and to help you facilitate getting your minority designation, certification, to do business with these companies. Your company that you're doing business with, the company you do business with, is it, it's not certified as a minority or a woman or anything like that, right? It is. It is? That's where you get your contracts. They're counting that spend from the federal government. Okay. Don't lose sight of that. Okay. But your bankers should be well informed if they truly are your business banker to help you and to guide you on that. You're looking for your business banker to not only worry about where your money's at, but you're also looking for them to help you. So when I have my customers and make sure they're on your list, Chamber of it. Karen comes, I, I invite her to everything. Everything. Expensive stuff, too. <laughs> so, and here's what you do. This is a rule that I do. And you don't have to follow my rule, but this is what I do. If I know that the bank is doing the, tw like Brother Rick Crusade, 25,000 front seat, right? Anthony Hamilton's performing right in front of me. I'm right here. You can be way in the back if you want to. But if the bank has an extra seat, there. So what happens, I wait till everybody got to kind of sit down, and then I walk in. And I walk right past everybody. Then I go to the front. Everybody's like, who's that brother? <laughs> who's he? I got to meet him. <laughs> I didn't pay a dime. The bank paid for it. <laughs> but now I'm Mr. Big Whip. You do the exact same thing. Huh? $50,000 $50, tape. I'm at the $50,000 tape. But I walk in. It's cool. I'm cool as the other side of the pillow. You know? That's what you do. And there's little tricks. But your banker should be doing it. And your banker should be making introductions for you. Okay? Introducing you to other folks who may do the business that you're doing or can do some B2B type stuff. And introduce you to the clients or people who can help you and assist you. Whether that's SCORE, whether that's the SBA, whether that's the Minority Business Development Council, there's a gamut of different things that a banker should be and willing to do. Because your success is their success. If my clients are doing extremely well, that's more money for me. It's in my portfolio. So I want to make sure you're doing well. Okay? I don't want to make sure. I don't, Last thing I want to do is make sure is you go out of business. Right. Okay? I want to make sure you're doing well. And if I can assist in that, I'm going to do it. Super Bowl came to San Diego. I had a customer did did security. She was, you know those Smith stores or no, no, I'm sorry, Henry's? The health food store? Yeah. So she had security. She had provided security for that. I said, why don't you come down to the Super Bowl? They're on the Super Bowl committee. They're, they're trying to see some people do some security stuff. And she said, I don't know. I said, come on down with me. Filipino lady. Went down there. She went down there, met with them. She got the Toyota contract. So she was going to do some the security for Toyota. Not a big thing. Not a big thing. Don't worry about it. Not a big thing. It's way better. She does. She said, Frank, I got the Toyota. I'm going to be doing their Super Bowl party. Blah, 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 blah. That's fantastic. Three days before the Super Bowl, the guy that was supposed to do the halftime security, he's out. They called her. She went in, she, you can see her if you Google it. She's the one walking around, walking Rex to Sylvia Dion for, for the Super Bowl. They were so pleased with her. She's done, the, she's done security for the Super Bowl for every Super Bowl after that. Wow. Now with that on her resume, she does NFL, she does the NBA, she does the uh, All-Star game. She came in a couple, uh, like a year or so later, pulled back. The, she said, I want to show you something. So I went out to the parking lot. She said, look, pulls the cover off of 9-11. Turbo, oh. Porsche, I'm like, is that mine? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, but I didn't know. I said, 
<laughs> Love to see her doing well. That's great. But that's what you're supposed to do as the banker. Okay? You ask about loans. Um, and I think, you, I think you asked about a loan or what you're looking for. Let me address that. For a bank, we only have two criteria that we look for. The ability to repay, that's it. And how good is your credit? And we always ask this question so it's not too dangerous. How's your credit experience? So we always ask that question. And it, it could be good, it could be bad. Understand that the SBA does not lend any money. They're just a guarantor for the, for the loan. There are certain types of SBA lending. You can find SBA Community Advantage. SBA Community Advantage is really geared towards people of color because what the SBA found was 95% of all of their lending was going to white men. 95. And so they said, wait a minute, we, we got something different here. We left, so they created community event. So we have other types of lending out there. One of the things that I also do for the bank, because here's what's happened. When you have a startup, startups are very difficult for a bank because there's a term that, that we are called, and that is dumb. And that's an acronym, D-U-M-B. Don't understand my business. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a person who's owning their own business, because here's what happens for a bank. A bank has got to look at historical data. Wait a minute, historic? I'm just starting. Right. So instead of looking out the windshield, we're looking at the rear view mirror of what's happened the last two years. So sometimes your business may be okay, but you get a major contract and your business starts to go up. We're still not gonna lend you money. <coughs> because that's new to us. That's not what you've done historically. So even then you're saying, right, you're, you're dumb. So where do you go? There are a lot of nonprofit organizations like CDC Small Business Finance, which is actually the number one 504 lender in the country. There are other folks out there that are reputable. There are some that are not reputable. Say that name again. Uh, CDC Small Business Finance. There are nonprofit entities. There are some for-profit folks who are going to gouge you. I'm going to, I'm going to completely not name them. Because <laughs> we live in an era where everybody got a tape recorder. And I'm not going to get in trouble. Um, so, but on top of that, it's, it's really around how can these organizations assist you? So you have organizations like SCORE, which are out there that are retired executives who want to help. You got the minority business councils, which are great. And you want to go through their process. This is fantastic. This is why we sponsor, because we believe in it so much. But what you want to do is you want to find those organizations that are actually going to work with you. And when you think the pricing is too high, or too, it is. It's time, if, if, if it's in your gut, get out. My mama said, don't mess with my, don't mess with my stomach. <laughs> okay. If it's in your gut, get out, all right? Financing can be the most difficult thing. There's only two things that I know that a small business owner wants. Access to capital and access to revenue. Everything else I don't wanna know. I, I, I'm running my business. I wanna figure out how to make money and I wanna figure out how to get the lending necessary to even grow it even further. And that's it. Okay. The bank should be, and I always tell people, well, the bank should always do the, the capital side. No, we should also help you with the revenue tie too. We should open up doors for you to look at that. A really good banker. So that's why I'm telling you, it may not be my bank. Because there are terrific bankers all across this country. And I know folks that follow a banker from with this bank to that bank to this bank to that bank because they know the banker will fight for you. And that's important. If your banker will not fight for you, you need to find another banker. If you set up this meeting in the next week or so, and somebody brushes you off and says, I don't have time to meet with you this week, you may need to find a new banker. Okay? Because what they're talking about is your dream. How are you gonna crush my dream? That's, a, that's stepping on my back, and I, I don't hunch down. I stand up straight. So you can't step on my back and you can't destroy my dream and my hope, for not for my family, okay? So, and I understand that, okay? 
So I'm going to stop right there because I want to. I want you to ask me questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, so like my business bank is with Chase. Okay. So who at Chase am I going to set this meeting up with? The branch manager, someone like your your position was community. Um, mm -hmm. Not me. You want to set up first to have that initial meeting with the person you're going to be doing business with a lot, and that should be your branch manager. Mm -hmm. Now, most times what happens within Chase and with every bank, excuse me, is you're also going to have something called a business banker within that branch who is going to be a dedicated person to help you and who knows more about business banking than anybody else in that office, even maybe even more than the branch manager he or she. Okay? So you want to first have that meet. See what they're talking about. See what they're, see what, say, look, and lay it out for them. I'm on a three-month plan to start my business. Have you started your business? Yes. Yeah, well, I have one business that's seven years old. Okay. And then when I just started. You should, have a, you should have a yearly meeting, mm -hmm. a yearly meeting, and an update. Where am I at? What projections? And tell them more about your business because they're out there meeting business people all the time who should be doing business with you. So, look, you need an army behind you. You can't be a one-man shop or one-person shop. You shouldn't be. Amen to that? Amen. You should be. You should have an army. CPA, a keeper, people out on the street. You made a great statement today. And that statement was, I tell everybody my business. I tell everybody. I almost got a whooping. No, I'm saying whooping. Excuse me. That's I almost got a whooping. I was 30. I'm 52 now, but I was 31, 32. No, about 33 years old. It was my dad. I was a branch manager of a place in Brawley and El Centro. I had 35 employees. I had seven salespeople. Now, you have to understand my dad. My dad's never hit me. My dad was dirt poor growing up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I mean, he had one pair of shoes. The joke was, my dad has two holes in his shoes so big, if he stepped on a coin, he could tell the difference between a nickel or a dime. <laughs> my dad was probably the most gifted orator I've ever heard. And could just have a conversation with anybody. And was a national sales director of finance company. Brilliant man. And taught me everything I know. I mean, just somebody get mad at you, son, don't let anyone steal your joy and walk off. And he would do this kind of thing. Here's what, here's what my dad and my thought process around building and doing what you're talking about your company. So my dad said, uh, so you got this new position. I said, yeah, dad, I've got this new position. I've got 35 employees and you know, I've got seven salespeople on the platform, right? New, new accounts, all the time. He said, how many people you got working for you? How many salespeople you got working for you? I said, uh, 35 and seven. And he stopped walking towards me. And he started, what did you say? And he hunched his head over. I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> this is not a good look. And what he said was, son, if you have 35 employees, you got 35 salespeople. They're all the same. They're selling the company. They're selling your name. Everybody sells in your company. If it's not the product, it's the company, the values, the mission, everything. So if you have, your family members are selling your company. Every day you sell your company. I wear a bow tie because I'm the only one in my bank that wears bow ties. You talk about a brand? My brand is my bow tie. So if somebody comes to me and they say, you know, Frank Robinson, because there's Julius Robinson, there's a couple other people in my bank, you know, they go, oh, the brother that wears the bow tie. Oh, that's right. <laughs> That's what I'm known for up and down the, in California. Okay, So I'm the bow tie banker. I have the courage to wear them, and damn it, I look good wearing them. Right. So, there you go. So what is your brand? And how do you carry that forward? So every day, you make sure you've got that army behind you. But going back to your question, and that was a long, I would, I went all the way down to Costa Rica and came back up to answer this question. But what you need to do is make sure you have that meeting, right? And then from that meeting, have a quarterly 
a semi-annual meeting on an update of where you are because a banker does not like to get surprises but if you could tell him great things and stories or him or her it's going to say wait a minute I got something for you because in seven years has your banker picked up the phone and called you hmm. don't blame him or her no 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 that ain't good enough you should have a line on it to figure out how much your money your banker is making for you honestly you should figure that out how many of you are in a service business? Going to be in a service business. Okay. How many of you are doing business with people that you pay money to? Verizon, yeah. AT&T, mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. They all have supplier diversity initiatives. They, sure they should be on your list. They all go to different events. They need to find out who you are because one of those things that I've learned so valuable, all of those people travel in packs. Right? And if they can't help you, somebody in that group may be able to help you. And one of the best things I've learned is they don't talk business nine to five. They're at the bar from six to nine. <laughs> 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 Am I lying? That's true. But it, and it's not like they're drunk. They just have a cocktail yeah. and they tell me about your business. Yeah. Oh, wait, you need to be. Wait, hey, Kim, come on over here. You know here. You know, this is Bob 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 from this company. I want you to meet this person. And that's how some of the best relationships are formed. Okay? So thank you for that question. Did I answer it? Did I get okay? Oh, all right. Any, any other questions that I may answer for you? Frank, could you speak a little bit about supplier diversity? Because it also because tonight we're talking about marketing. And yeah. so how that reels into supplier diversity. A lot of us hear it. But unless you're in that realm, in that world, you don't know how that supplier diversity element works and how you market your products and how you can get in that door. Sure. So supplier diversity is basically what corporations, the government, everybody else is spending and look to spend with women, minorities, and veterans. And sometimes you may hear the word DBE, or the acronym DBE, Diverse Business Enterprises. So how much money are they spending to these DBEs? Okay, so I'll give you an example. Union Bank, we are, we only spend about $500 million a year. Only 500 million, well look, Wells Fargo probably spends close to a billion dollars on IT alone. Just kidding, I'm putting out ads right now. Right? <laughs> they do. And if you have a nonprofit like you do, you should be definitely going after Wells Fargo. And I know, I know some very good people at Wells. Um, because they announced that they went for two hundred twenty million dollars that they're going to give away last year to four hundred million dollars this year. So there's more money in the kitty for them to give away. You don't have to pay that back. That's just, but that's a five hundred one c three nonprofit kind of thing. But let's get back to supplier diversity. Wells will probably spend about a billion dollars in IT alone. So if you're selling food, tables, chairs, if you're selling a service, if you're telling stories, you need to be signed up. And phone etiquette, we talked about that. We just bought, we just put in a phone center. We just put in a phone center. You know where we put it in? Jamaica. Jamaica. Exactly. Queen's English. Polish, as you can tell. What the job, bop, bop, bop. Jamaica. So you talk about, but you'll see these, these call centers go up. Who needs to teach that? Well, it should be a person of color. It and it should be you, right? If you, if you I have the business. <laughs> exactly. So what you, the first thing you need to do is make sure you're certified as a woman-owned or minority-owned business, which you probably are. Then from there, you want to make sure that you are at certain events, like the National Minority Supplier Development Council's event, Southern California one, uh, that uh, Virginia. Yeah, she's Filipino. Yeah. She's the president of CEO. Make sure you go to their events. And I'm pretty sure they'll share information about those. And what they are is these major corporations will come in and figure out who do I want to and figure out I'm just I'm looking to do business with them. Do business with you. And they have something called supplier diversity managers. Supplier diversity managers are advocates within the company that are looking for companies like yourself to figure out how do I get to get business with them. Because here's what's happened. 
to get a major contract with the government. You have to show that you're doing a certain amount of business with African American, Hispanic, yeah. and Asian. And they do not, do not want that just a lump number. They want that itemized. Okay? So, like for us, we demand, we buy all of our paper and everything else from a company called, uh, it used to be Staples. And in Staples' contract, we said 35% of the paper that you buy have to come from people of color. They fell below that, so we fired them. Mm -hmm. Now we're at Office Depot, where we told them they got to be 40%, and they're hitting that number. So banks will demand that because here's what's happened. We report that number to the federal government, and that number is part of what we call our Community Reinvestment Act, so we have to do it. Corporations think it's the right thing to do. It makes no sense for Apple to go out and look to buy and sell products to people of color. Because if you, I used to be in the music business. Everything was Apple that we used for putting music together. Everything. You didn't, IBM, PC. It was all Apple products, right? So it makes no sense for us to, to turn around and for Apple to turn around and say, we can't do business with black people. And look how much money they're spending. It may be nothing, minuscule. So they hired people like Scott, who runs Supplier Diversity at Apple. And he's looking for black companies to do business with them. Now, last time I checked, Apple was at a trillion dollars. The value? Yep. I, I, I just need one tenth of one percent. That's all I want. I'm good. I agree. But I'll take one tenth of one percent for that. Okay? So supplier diversity works that way, but it's your it's your way to get into those companies. Now understand, and I'm not gonna lie to you. Be honest. It may take years to develop some of those relationships. Do not think you're going to get it overnight. But when those opportunities hit, they can be good. I actually got into a cab years ago, and this is the real. This is the one I know it can be real. So I like custom made. Like I get my suits. I go somewhere and get them done. I actually fly to Thailand to get my stuff done. But I saw this brother get into a town car with me because we shared a ride back to the airport. I know his watch was at least 50,000. And his suits were like at least 10 to 20. And I, I could just, I was looking at him and go, oh, good God. And I just, you know, you could just tell. And I sat there and I go, and so I said, brother, what do you do? You know, you're coming back from the conference. He said, well, I, I have a deal with, I have a contract with Ford. I said, oh, okay, you know. So what do you do? He says, well, I supply all the seat belts for every Ford car in America. Jesus. Who knew? Who knew, right? I, I want to add something. This is some of what we talked about last week when I talked about your certifications. But one of the best known secrets, though it's not really a secret, I used to be a supplier diversity officer okay. not too long ago. But we have this club. It's called the Billion Dollar Roundtable. Yep. It's not a secret club because it's not secret, but I doubt if 10 people know about it if you ask a, a, a crowd of 100. In order to belong to the Billion Dollar Roundtable, you have to do one, no, you have to do $3 billion with people of color. And there's probably 20 or 30 companies that belong to the billion dollar round table. <coughs> so that's just saying as a marketing tool, mm -hmm. if you wanted to find out who's doing the most in supplier diversity, you would want to start with the billion dollar yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and then Google companies that you want to do business with and see if they have supplier diversity. Look at it, you'll find out they have a supplier diversity manager listed, phone number, contact, here's how you sign on board, here's how you do business with them. That's marketing, that's easy as, Man, that's super easy. Now, don't come to me talking about selling me incense. <laughs> but if you're talking about selling something that the bank would use, do that. I had somebody come to me and ask me about buying incense for the bank. I'm like, what you know, But that's what happens, okay? You can do those supplier work, and that's part of marketing. And that's supplier diversity. Um, look, seriously think about where your company wants to be because if you're thinking about selling to individual people, fantastic. If you're thinking about selling to corporations, it's great. 
move that direction too. Because every all these things are distribution channels for you to make more revenue stream. And I find that that's what happens with the bank is important. We want to see all those different types of revenue stream when it comes to financing and getting a loan. Yes, ma'am. You have a question. I missed out uh, a second part. He said a national or some name. National Minority Supplier Development Council. National Minority Supply and Development Council. So supplier. Supplier Development Council. Supplier Development Council. Yes, ma'am. And you can Google them. They are fantastic. They have a list of all the corporations that done, that have a supplier diversity department and have a, is a partner with that organization. And you're going to be blown away by that. <coughs> it is probably, and you know this, it is probably the best darn convention you ever want to go to <laughs> in your life if you're a small business, if you're a business owner. It is by far the, it will take, you can't even walk the number of business corporations that are there in one day. You can't. You have to strategically look and say, okay, I can get this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. If you want the head of Starbucks or the supplier diversity, you got him. And you can just walk right up to him at the convention. You want to go over here? But you can't get through everybody. It's just that big and it's just that one day. And then the best business is at that night at the bar. True. <laughs> I'm not kidding. There are there's so many different, and if you know people Especially if you get in with the bank and the banker should try to tell you, here's my supplier diversity manager, they're not gonna be able to do anything, but maybe they can help you and assist you in finding out somebody. Somebody you want to hear. And they should be walking you around talking to other folks. Because the best thing, somebody said it earlier, and I'm gonna leave with this. It was like, um, you said it. I don't advertise, it's really word of mouth on a company that you was gonna do business with, what you're doing. What I find is, if I'm a supplier diversity manager, because there is something called um, the financial <coughs> roundtable, which all 40 banks, the top 40 banks in the country do business. If I, if, well, if the guy from Wells Fargo comes up to me and says, Cynthia is awesome, you need to be doing business with her. I'm gonna be doing business with you. Now, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and I, we will beat each other up over your checking account. <laughs> but when it comes to supplier diversity, we don't compete. We don't compete on supplier diversity, and we don't compete on foundation stuff, philanthropy type stuff. But the two things that we don't compete again, supplier diversity, because I'm going to take your word because they all hang out together. And they, they have to get the same goals. But if I know this company is reputable and they're good, I'm going to use them too. And you should, if you're in one bank, you should be using all the banks. Don't think, oh God, I don't want that relationship with Wells Fargo because I have a contract with Bank of America. Oh no. That contract with Bank of America should allow you to get in with Wells Fargo and with Bank of the West and Union Bank and all the other banks, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different kind of philosophy on that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have another question. My seven-year business is a nonprofit. Okay. And then there's quite a few of us in here that are doing nonprofits. And so um, I kind of, my question is like in getting nonprofit like funding from like your local bank, whatever. I know a lot of them have you know, different things, but what advice would you give? Because a lot of this is for businesses, but as a nonprofit, like you can't get SBA certified. And that's what my research told me. Yeah. You tell me if I'm wrong. You can't get SBA uh, guaranteed because you're a nonprofit. There are some things that you can't get, like because, because there's no guarantors. You can't, yeah. can't be. You can't. You can't. Like you, remember years ago, there's a company that used to be called Curves. For just for women, mm -hmm. yeah. yes. they couldn't get SBA financing because they, they barred their membership against men. Oh. So SBA was like, no, you can't get financing. Okay? But what you're talking about on, on, on nonprofits, there's two levels. Number one, are you talking about funding or are you talking, and funding can be financing for your business or are you talking about grant money to try and get some money to help run your companies? Both. Okay. Financing for nonprofit is still the same no matter where you go. You're going to get a 990 because you got 990s, right? On nonprofits, you need to know the difference, a 990. But some of the best, most profitable businesses that I know of are nonprofits. Okay? So that financing is going to be the same. Here's where the difference when you think about getting funding from a foundation at a bank to help you get support. There's two levels. There's one that's called corporate giving. How many of you have a nonprofit? I'm sorry, I didn't even ask that. Okay, there's corporate giving, okay? 
and there's also what is called uh, a foundation grant. So, um, I'm gonna use your company if I may. Okay. So, the development corporation runs programs. So you can apply for funding under a grant, foundation grant support. Okay? And so that's gonna be to help run the different programs that they have. And for a bank, we want stuff around financial education, technical assistance for small business owners. We don't do dog shows. We ain't doing that. We're not doing certain, certain other things that we, we just don't do, okay? But if it's around affordable housing that fits our mission, then we're gonna do it. Some companies love the arts. We're not big on the arts as a bank, okay? So I'm just gonna let you know that. So you have the foundation grant which runs your program. Now, if you wanna run a gala or an event, you get corporate sponsorship. That's a different bucket. You, you, you have two buckets with underneath the foundation. Grants, okay? Corporate sponsorships for an event. So if you hear like Brotherhood Crusade, everybody knows Brotherhood Crusade, they'll run this big gala. They apply for a grant, they apply for a corporate sponsorship for a fifty thousand dollar table, right? Then they come back to us and says, but we're running these programs to help we did a youth entrepreneurial challenge where we did it like a junior shark tank. So we funded that and that was in one of the programs. So that came under the grants, but then we also did the fifty thousand dollar table over here for the corporate sponsorship. And that money, of course, is your money. We don't, you don't pay that back. That's not a loan. That's, that's money. Who do you go to for the corporate sponsorship? Don't go to a bank. Don't go to your local branch. Mm -hmm. when, you, 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 when you started saying that, I was like, no, 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 no. no, no, no. Right? <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Because, hell, some of them don't even know where to go. Okay? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. What you want to do is you want to go to the website of the bank, and most of it is an online application. Okay. Understand that, but don't fill it out now. Here's what you do. You make sure that somebody in the bank, spe specifically the foundation director or an officer, invite them to your organization for a site visit beforehand. Because if you start filling out that thing and turn it in, it's gonna go to Never Never Land because there's nobody supporting it. But there's an organization out here called Educating Young Minds. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm actually on their board, okay? So here's what happened. When Angelise applies for a loan, I mean, a, applies for a grant, in part of that grant, there's gonna say, who do you know? Carolyn Dutton, she puts my name. No, I don't. Know. You know, yeah, you do. <laughs> you do, you put my name. What happens, an email is then sent to me do I know this organization? Tell me about it. Do we have volunteer hours, opportunities? Who's on the board? This, that, and the other. And I write up what it's all about. That is then submitted to the foundation for approval. They look at my write up and they said, oh, Frank's the managing director. Oh, Frank's in the corporate social responsibility. Oh, this person's on the board. These guys are influential. This is what they're doing. They're helping out the board. And I write it all down. If you don't have that person, that's blank. That thing's blank. Never, never land. Or better yet, no. Okay. Should she so, put someone at the bank on the board? Huh? Should she put someone at the bank on the board? Okay, y'all want to get real? <laughs> you want to get real? Yeah. Wells Fargo requires it. Exactly. You be very strategic about who you have on your board. You want a banker? Insurance company. You want a lawyer, okay? You want at least those because what happens is you want to find, and you want somebody from a public utility. Mm. Oh, that's, that's the killer because they got the most money. Yeah. Because they got to give out that money because they are a nonprofit themselves in a sense because they can't be short a profit. So they got to give out that money. So you want somebody from a public utility on your board. Frank, let me also say, the first thing Frank said in the beginning, know your banker. In the nonprofit field, you have to know people. You've got to get out and network. Yeah. I mean, I was with Bank of America back then, was one of the first banks when I ran a place called Home in South Central. And Bank of America, I courted them, 
I put events together so that they could have Bank of America people come and volunteer. I went to their affiliate organizations, their African American employees, their Hispanic employees, their Asian employees. I was like, oh, I have something for you. Come see these kids and work with us. And got all these volunteers. I ate more Dodger dogs at Bank of America <laughs> games because they would invite me to different things. And eventually, I got the big grant. I got the $250,000 leadership grant. And then every year, I would get money. I would get it. I would just get it back and wow. forth. But that was the relationship that started me with the other banks. But you've got to have a relationship with the banker. I had one <coughs> banker. The way I got to the banker was from a, a high wealth management banker that wanted to stay in touch with me because I had a board member that was high net worth. Right. And I said, my board member banks with Bank of America. Oh, let me tell him that you guys have come down here. Oh, who's your board member? And then when they saw his name, that's your board member? That's my chair. Good. So, really so all, right. all of a sudden, they became more interested in making sure I was at every Dodger game. Right. And everything, and then it, the relationship continued with the Wells Fargo, with the union, with you know, we got all the different banks started coming on board because they don't compete when it comes to. We, we, and we don't want to, and we want to give out the money, and we want to figure out who to give it to. When you speak about somebody on your board, there's a guy named Ed Burr down in San Diego. He runs a company called Edco, the waste management company. E D C O, Ed's company. He's not very creative. <laughs> um, that's his company, Ed Coe, Ed Burke, and he owns this waste management company. He's got a son up and doing all this stuff. He called me up one time and said, Frank, I need you to write a check for $50,000 to give to the Junior Seau Parks and Recreation Foundation. 50000 He said, yeah, you want my business? Now, I understand this guy makes millions of dollars in that. So we, of course, we wrote the check. So I'm presenting him the check for 50 I'm presenting it to the executive director, like yourself, of the foundation, all of a sudden, see an arm come around me. It's the guy from Wells Fargo with a check for a hundred. Wow! Exactly, mm -hmm. director didn't do a darn thing, but got one hundred fifty thousand dollars because Ed made one phone call. Exactly. Strategically, look on who you want on your board. Now, understand that sometimes you're higher in. And here's another trick I'm gonna give you, just because it's you. But I'm gonna share it with the whole group. <laughs> <laughs> Get a board. But you got some people who are very high net worth clients. They can't come to your board meeting. So set up an advisory board. Yeah, there you go. Okay. That meet twice a year. Have a catered lunch. <coughs> Invite the kids so they get some photo ops and stuff like that. I don't know what kind of nonprofit you have. Set it up. They're cute. Okay. I have a performing arts school. Do a performance. Yeah. Do a performance. A selective performance for some of the key people and their guests because they're only going to invite their best friends and let the checks rain down. Okay. But your advisory board is the ones that's going to get you. They're the money makers. They're the ones who are going to make the phone call to some folks that you need to support this. And they're going to call all their high net worth clients and friends and say, hey, come on to this performance. It's this organization I get with and everything else. Because most people in America, they have a good heart. You never, you, people don't write checks with their hands. They don't even write it with their head. They write it with their heart. So get to their heart. Having a performance and stuff like that, and it's just for a selected group, and nice food, everything else, don't it? Buys your board. Then you make your money. Your, your board of directors, like what I'm on, that's your working board. That's the fo poor folk. Yes. But we the worker people. But your advisory is going to be somebody else. Okay? Yes, ma'am. And my client base will be from the regional centers and so forth. So it is a profitable business and it's Very. booming and it's in demand and all of that. Since this will be my first home, what do you think the chances are of getting a small business loan? You have to go the SBA route. Or, let me ask you this question because I have a friend of mine who lives in um, Rancho Santa Fe. And he has those kind of homes. Uh, and he found a very unique model. I'm going to share it with you. Okay. So what he did is he found big homes that the government, or better yet, the banks had maybe in repo, something like that. 
and he was able to get a better deal on those homes. And because what we found is people don't want to be away from the family. They, they want a kitchen. They want their own bedroom. They don't want it kind of like sterile and like a hospital kind of feel, right? So he made it into a home, then shared it with the neighbors and said, look, these are young people. They're really great. They're just good people. They got some there, you'll never have any issues, or, you know, this, that, and the other. And he found in some really good neighborhoods. Because what they were getting from the government paid for everything, um, and it paid for the mortgage, everything else, the person was starting to bankroll. And so they started, being, they started, they look at different places. Now, LA's kind of high, so they were looking at Phoenix. They were looking at Tempe. In different areas where you could get a big home for a little price. But then they were also, because they overexpanded, there was there were some issues around, hey, there's some availability of these homes, so there was some ROI, or, I'm sorry, some repossessions and stuff like that on, on that, some foreclosures, excuse me. So they were able to do really, really great. His business model was to take, make it a home environment and just have it there. And he even had a nurse live there. And that was part of her salary was to live there with them. He expanded the model to also include to, to other homes to include people who were elderly, whose parents they wanted to put into something like that as opposed to putting them into a home. And these are the people that were affording to pay $10,000 a month. Because you've got those kind of people who said, I don't want my mama living with me, but I do want her somewhere. That's going to be safe in the environment. So she changed. They changed her business model a little bit, but they did both of those. Now, for an SBA, you're, because it's new, you're going to have to go the SBA route for the most part. There, there are, and because it's going real estate, there's three factors: ability to repay. So your business model that you put together, the marketing kind of thing, to understand that this is the kind of money you're going to be making from it, and let that say, hey, this is this is our net. Will we be able? Will be able to pay this? Yes. Yeah. Own, if you can, own the home. Okay? Because that's the other thing. The value of the home's got to be there, everything else. Because you can hold on to that real estate and transfer that real estate over is the creation of wealth in this country. Okay? So that's one thing that people of color do not do very well, and we haven't done for a long time, is the, is the ability to transfer that wealth over to the next generation. And I see that quite a bit. Okay? So, Yes, you could. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of due diligence. But um, my pastor always said to me, you know, anytime you get a setback, don't take a step back because God's already preparing you for the comeback. That's it. Okay? So as a result of that, you're going to have these difficulties, especially because it's somebody, it's, it's not easy to get into that because there are people doing that. Um, and, and sometimes they always have, but if you prove it on black and white in the paper, there should be no way they say no. You know, but you got to get a banker and get this team involved to say, this looks dynamite. And, and, and this is what really should happen. They should be nudging you like this, go, I can't get in on that. After they do this, they're going to figure out, hey, can I get in this with you? Because that's what I do with some of my clients when I look at the stuff, I'm like, darn, this going to be. Gonna be making some money. <laughs> I get in on this. That's what you want. Okay, sure. Any other questions I may answer for you? Uh, I know I'm keeping you for the freeway. <laughs> yes, you said now public utility. Who do you find? SoCal Gas, SoCal Edison, yep. Verizon. Look at your phone bill. Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those. The okay. water district, I mean, they all, they're publicly regulated utility companies. They have to do business with people of color. Okay. They all have supplier diversity matters. And if you do, just look at it, and you know, they'll tell you the program they got. All of us know people who are doing business with those utility companies. I know these folks do. And they are not, they, they do well. They do well. Yes, sir. So, uh, saying you draft a draft a, a proposal, give it to the, the diversity manager and the public, uh, the uh, utilities, public utilities. Mm -hmm. just pick one. The name, just pick one. That's yeah. That. Look, I not one. Pick them all. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't be selfish with your talent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So you should be looking at all these companies 
But if you think you've got something that you can sell them, you want to look at all of them. And, but I always tell myself, if I have my own business, I would look at the companies, I would look to see who is the, region, who is the supplier diversity manager, build a relationship, you know, tell them more about, and not try and sell them, oh, this is what I do. How you doing? How's your family? Everything else? You know, I win because I do the Mike Tyson thing. Uh, you know how? You know why Mike Tyson knocked people out with one punch? Nine. They never saw it coming. Look at all the other films. The guy's had his head up right here, and the punch come over here, and didn't even see it. The shock of getting hit like that knocked him out. You got to hit people and knock them out, and they didn't even feel it. They didn't even know it was coming. So I talk to him, butter up, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Can I get you a drink? This is what I do for the company. Well, tell me what, how you got in this business. Tell me more about, because one thing I learned about successful people, they love to talk about themselves. So I let them talk about themselves. And then, and then all of a sudden I hit them. Bam! Oh, I do that kind of business. This is, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know this guy? And I try and figure out how I can help them. My dad always said, add before you ask. You need to add value to somebody before you ask for their business. So when I talk to business to business anybody, I try to figure out how I can add value. Then I help. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that for bank funding, they're going to be looking at historical data. What kind of documents? How, how far back? Two years. At least two years. You're going to look at, so you're going to look at your tax returns for two years. You're going to look at uh, sometimes three, but most likely it's two years on your, because that can set a trend for them. Um, so you go on your tax returns. If you're buying an existing business, they're going to look at their tax returns too, how that business has been trended. Okay? Um, credit score, how's your credit? And, and that's it on those. If it happens to involve some type of real estate that you're going to do, they want to see the appraisal of the business and see appraisal of the, of, the, of the office or the home to make sure the value is there. And then you just start having that relationship because I can guarantee you, if you have a very good relationship with your banker, that banker is fighting back and forth with the underwriter and, and trying to mitigate some of the risks to hopefully get that loan approved for you. If you don't have a good banker because that person is a salesperson, God help you. <laughs> that's why, seriously, that's why you need to you need to interview your banker just like you were interviewing somebody to get a job with you. Because that person's on your team. That's part of your army. Thank you. I was just going to add, I, I know that uh, Mike Tyson has been around for those who take the time to tune in on Saturday. There are two magazines, and they print the list of the Fortune 500 supplier diversity managers for all of the Fortune 500 companies that have supplier diversity programs. That may be of interest to you guys. I really don't know. But if you're Lauren, interested. If you get it to us, we can put it in the portal as well. That's right. We can load it on up Saturday. on the resources. Okay. Okay. That, that sounds like homework. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not like and, and also, uh, Frank, I know you're not trying to be everybody's banker, and I know you're not trying to sell <laughs> Union Bank. But if anybody wanted to talk to you about Union Bank, is there any way that they can reach you yeah, or absolutely. someone here? Uh, first of all, my phone number is the easiest one in the bank. My number is 619-230-4500. Do not call 238-4500. That's the Wyndham Hotel. <laughs> okay. I get that all the time. Two three uh, six one nine two three zero forty five hundred. That's my that's my that directly on my desk. My email address is easy. Frank dot Robinson at unionbank.com. That's the easiest. You know. I'm up and down the state quite a bit because I run, like I said, the high school branches. I got this, that, and the other. My boss years ago told me where I want to be, and I said, where do you want me to be? And he goes, I just need you anywhere near an airport. I, I you know, jump on a plane quite a bit. Did you say 619? 619. I'm in San Diego. That's where I live. Yes, ma'am. I'm interested in having a business that can help preserve African-American home ownership mm -hmm. and support it. 
And I don't know because when I think about it, it seems as if then you could get hit with being uh, uh, segregating. Absolutely not. Oh, thank you. Absolutely not. So, no, no. Because you're going to find bankers, look, the biggest problem that bankers have when it comes to when we do mortgage is we do not run, we do not do loans with black people. I'm going to be blunt. Our numbers when it comes to African Americans is dismal. But you ask any bank in the country, it's dismal. When we look at home ownership among African Americans, it is such a crisis that companies like yourself should be going to us and telling us how to figure this out. So if you got the intel on that, you should be coming to us, not only on the side of the foundation, but on the side of being a subject matter expert. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because our probably, in, in Oakland, and this is public information, because this is how you win. Can I, share, you, can I tell how to win? Go to Humna. Get the Humna data. You know this. Get the Humna data on banks across California and where loans and how many loans they've done to African Americans. City of Oakland, Union Bank did two loans in 2017. No. Two to black people. Just two. You could take that information and say, Union, I can help you get loans to African Americans. Whether it's a campaign, whether it is how to go out in the street and meet people, knock on people's doors, setting up workshops, whatever. We don't have the bandwidth for that. But we can pay somebody like you to do that. I'll give you an example. There's a woman named Carol H. Williams. Anybody know Carol H. Williams, advertising agency? Yes, I know her. Carol Williams is like the number one lady in the world. You ever heard this uh, secret thing that says, strong enough for a man but made for a woman? Yes. That's her tagline. She did that, African American female. Anybody ever see the, the Coors beer? And she, she, Coors beer could not sell to black people. Couldn't figure it out. They called her. She goes, well, hell, you ain't gonna sell no black, you ain't gonna sell no beer to black people when you got a white man sitting on a Rocky Mountain with a cowboy hat on. <laughs> so she created the silver bullet can, and it was a little tray that came through. Remember that? You saw the commercial, and everybody got cold, it was so hot. What does a tray remind you of? Soul train. <laughs> Subliminally, people thought soul train. Soul train. Coors beer for, in the black community. Coors beer sold like crazy. Wow. Carol H. Williams. So we hired. I hired Carol H. Williams. Help me figure out how to do more loans to black people. Home loan. She did. Cost me a million dollars. But we do more loans to black people. That's how much she charged She charged for, you need to be paid for your intellect. Black people don't do that enough. We don't get paid for our intellect as much as white people. And we are smart. We are just as smart. Okay? Because we have much more intelligence within our own community than somebody who doesn't. So Carol was in and came in and said, this is why you know. You don't have a strategic partnership with black churches. You don't have a strategic partnership with some of these other organizations. You are not marketing ways in which your imagery and your ideas and thoughts are not conveyed, and your messaging is all wrong. You can't say this to a black person and think that it's relevant. Change the whole thing up. Wow. Then I got the bill. But the bank paid because we needed them. You get paid, for you. so don't think about that segregation or. Uh, that, that's going to be script. No. <coughs> Carve out your niche. But go to Humna Data. H U N N A. Mm -hmm. Home, mortgage, um, just home mortgage, and they, and they have the data. It's public. You, they, you can see what banks are doing in any city by people of color, everything. So does it talk about gentrification? How to you have to do your, you have to get your research on that, but it will talk about how many loans we've done by each bank. With that data, with the other data, put that back in, come to a bank and say, let me, let me solve your issue. Because here's what banks are doing now. I, as a bank, have to go and buy loans. 
from somebody who has a couple of black people loans for black people, and I have to pay a premium for that to put it back on my books to show that I have loans for black people. Wow. wow. As a requirement for your community reunion. You got it now. Now you get it. You help me solve this so I don't have to pay a premium. And I'll pay you that money. And plus, and if I could generate it myself, it saves me a lot of work than having to go out and buy it. Because some of these guys are going out and buying it, and if they got a loan for a buck, I got a, I got a loan in my house. That thing's been flipped three times. I know they keep selling, 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 because I, I checked the box and I'm black. You wonder why you, sometimes your mortgage is sold? You're black. They need, that, they, need that, they need that loan. They need that loan on their books. Do your research. I mean, you you. Yes, sir. You had one more question. Yeah, just uh, is, is that AACC? Because when I mean, when I first came to California, that's who I wanted to work for immediately. Yeah. But is she still up and running? She up, up and running. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's up in Oakland. She got an office in Chicago, Oakland, and DC. Yeah. Oh, gosh. And New York. Talk for Yes. She's brilliant. You talk about somebody who, who, somebody's off charge. Let's give Frank a round of applause. Thank you very much. You're not going to hear it from any place else, but you've got to hear it here because we're banking on your success, and that's somebody who's going to help you have success.